welcome everyone to this uh, uh, interview, this uh, uh, session, the first one of uh, hopefully many to, uh, to come at uh, uh, SFU's uh, Burnaby Mountain Campus on the unceded territories of the Slate with Musqueam and Coquitlam uh, uh, peoples. We are uh, in uh, uh, the Hellenic Studies uh, corridor, uh, part of the SNF Center for uh, Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University, and uh, we have with us, uh, having taken the long trip from uh, uh, Spain, uh, the historian and colleague, uh, uh, Kostis Kornetis. Uh, before we proceed with uh, our interview, an interview that will be, con will be conducted by myself, Dimitris Kralis, and uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Irini Kotsovili, I'll uh, ask uh, Kostis to tell us a bit about his journey, other than the Madrid-Vancouver one, the uh, academic journey that got him into history. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dimitri Rini, for having me. Uh, it, it was a long journey. I started off uh, studying history in Munich, then London. I took my PhD in Florence. Uh, and um, then I had also a, an academic itinerary in, in the United States. Um, I taught at Brown, um, New York University, then I went to Madrid, Oxford, Sheffield, and back to Madrid, finally with um, a tenured position in, uh, I'm an assistant professor in contemporary history. And I work on 20th century European history, mainly uh, the European South that we're going to, to talk about. Uh, and uh, my first monograph was on mm, social movements, student movement against the colonel's dictatorship in Greece uh, from 67 to 74. It's called Children of the Dictatorship. And uh, now, mm, in, in these days in, in Vancouver, and I think today as well, uh, it's a great opportunity of uh, presenting snippets uh, of my forthcoming monograph, uh, which is on the three generations of transition in uh, Greece, Spain, and Portugal. Excellent. So um, we're both uh, historians, uh, but um, as we were uh, talking about uh, earlier on, I'm from a very different era. Uh, I'm a, myself a, a medievalist, and I wonder whether uh, uh, we could open up our uh, conversation with um, uh, perhaps a general reflection on uh, on. Uh, on the historical tradition, uh, and here I'll, I think I'll use the privilege of the interviewer to, to, to plunge us back to, to my own era and maybe see if we can uh, uh, find a way to, to reflect on perhaps universals or maybe non-universals uh, in, the, in the study of history. So I'll, I'll read to you from uh, the text, the, introductor, the introduction to the work of an 11th century historian who has basically given me my job and um, is earning my bread uh, for me. Uh, and let's, uh, and I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on some of uh, what he describes as the main concerns of a historian and how as someone working in uh, the modern era you might uh, engage with those. So history is the primary preoccupation of many wise men of the past. It has proven to be exceedingly useful for life as it reveals the lives of those who were virtuous and those who were not describes illustrious deeds born of flawless planning and effort, as well as inglorious actions caused by the faulty planning or negligence of those governing public affairs. Above all, it tells us about those who hold the highest office, how some of them successfully overcame clear and present dangers through their diligent military strategies, while others, even when history was about to smile upon them, ruined everyone's hopes for a happy outcome, but not by not making prudent use of the opportunities given to them. All these things are stripped bare by history, and, as we said, there is much utility in them, for they convey clear instruction and set patterns for the future. They simply lead us to imitate what was discerned well and to avoid ill-advised and shameful deeds in wars, battles, and in all other most necessary offensive ventures and challenges of defense. So, how arcane, current, relevant, irrelevant does this much older, thousand-year-old conception of history uh, becomes to someone working in your era? It's a very interesting excerpt. Uh, I think that we can always find um, 
um, uh, interesting lessons to to be learned from um, from writings of this kind, uh, which I think belongs to the um, school of thought according to which uh, you know we can we can learn from uh, from past deeds. Um, this has been challenged uh, that there are colleagues of, of ours nowadays who believe the the opposite. Um, one of the aphorisms that has become very popular is uh, that one thing that you can learn from history is that you cannot learn anything from history. Um, but I don't necessarily ascribe to uh, to that school. Um, I believe that um, there are uh, it's it's always an interesting exercise to uh, to weigh ourselves uh, against other eras, other epochs. But what you just r read, I think, is also representative of a particular kind of historiography that was uh, sort of inevitably at that time focusing on mm, the rulers, um, the, the moral rulers or, or the immoral rural, uh, rulers, the, um, uh, the corrupt ones versus the virtuous ones, the courageous ones versus the, cow the cowardly ones. I think um, there we can see how historiography has moved on and progressed. Uh, I would say that um, nowadays, of course, there is, there is a trend in, in still in what we call political history, still interested in, in people who ruled well, the leaders, let's say, nowadays. Uh, but there is more and more interest in, in the lower echelons uh, of, um, of society, you know, what we could call ordinary people uh, and, uh, and so on. So I would say that uh, one thing that we can definitely deduct from what you just read is how far we've moved on in terms of how we understand history from this idea of the elites, mm -hmm. uh, um, which is, of course, it's, it's always relevant, uh, but, but I think that there, mm, we have a much more holistic mm, approach to society nowadays. I, th I think that uh, uh, this is kind of critical, and people uh, in my shoes having to engage with these kinds of sources uh, basically need to excavate uh, the rest of society out of this, um, these texts. Uh, one of the questions that um, uh, historians uh, like Mikhail Italiatis back then uh, dealt with, but also historians uh, today deal with, even as he was considering back then the question of utility, was uh, questions of impartiality and questions of objectivity, especially given their uh, direct engagement with political events. These were not professional historians gaining their daily bread from this. They did other things and then they also wrote uh, some, some history. Uh, how do such questions of objectivity and impartiality uh, come into your work and your concerns as you engage with very current, um, often recently lived uh, experiences? Well, they, they come up a lot because, I mean, as you're saying, I operate in what we could call history of present time. Um, it's this French term, right? Yeah, histoire du temps présent. So it's, uh, it's something that I inevitably had to, to deal with. M most of the people I talk about are still alive. And this is one of the, the major challenges in my own work, uh, very much based on the tools and, and methodology of oral history. I, I use interviews. So mm, inevitably, when you use interviews and you talk about people's experiences, their own memories, uh, what we understand with as objectivity is necessarily compromised. Uh, I'm more interested in historicizing people's subjectivity, and uh, it's, a, it's a major challenge there. Um, but I would say, and you know, you made me think by by using this Byzantine uh, writer of earlier. Uh, writers, earlier historians, uh, and I would say this typical bras affair between mm, this mm, kind of historiography versus Herodotus. 
I would say that we're more and more into, and me personally through my work, into Herodotus, and the kind of history he was making, uh, which was very much, I mean, what we could call an anthropological approach to history, um, a thick description of um, you know what was going on at the time, uh, leaving it open very, very, very often to interpretation. Is it true? Is it not? Is it a tale? Is it not? Is it a subjective approach of the locals uh, or not? And, and I would say that th there is something mm, particularly and strikingly modern about uh, the way in which Herodotus was thinking about history. I mean, uh, of course, there, there are many modern elements in Thucydides. You know, this is, I'm, I'm far from discrediting his approach. But I would say that uh, the 20th century, especially, especially the second part, second half of the 20th century in terms of historiography um, and people who influenced me historiographically, my own professors, my own supervisor, Luisa Passerini, one of the, mm, let's say, mm, founders of what we call oral history uh, nowadays, were much closer to that idea of um, ob objectivity somewhat mm, being uh, an unattainable thing, uh, a very 19th century positivistic idea in terms of history, that we don't, mm, we don't have to feel necessarily uh, mm, compromised by its weight. Having said that, however, I I need to say that I don't subscribe to the postmodern idea, the Hayden White idea of everything is text. I believe that things happened, mm -hmm. and but that inevitably trying to make sense of them and give them meaning, uh, we need to narrativize them and plot them and so on and, uh, and so forth. So. I would say that I'm trying to carve out a middle ground there, but it's very difficult. Um, I'm really glad you, uh, you just uh, gave a shout out to, to, to Herodotus. Um, in so many ways, for, for the very reasons that, that you describe, because uh, uh, of the open-endedness of the historical enterprise that, uh, that appears in, uh, in, in Herodotus's work, and the, the fact that uh, uh, François Artaud has this uh, Mirror of Herodotus uh, book uh, speaking about how even the tall tales he tells might be ways of uh, putting a mirror before us and forcing us to think about ourselves, uh, which of course raises the question of history as a, a reflective enterprise. And, uh, and you do work with, uh, with questions of memory. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, if I were to to go down the path of memory, uh, do you see yourself as a shaper of memory through history, as a facilitator for the production of strains of memory through your interviews? How, how do you see yourself when doing that work? That's a, it's an excellent question and a very difficult one. Um, maybe facilitator uh, is a good way of, um, of labeling it. Um, it's a memory is a very, of course, um, kind of fleeting concept. Uh, are we talking about collective memory or individual memory? Where do the two meet, if ever? Um, and these are these are questions that I constantly have in my mind and, and in my in in my writing. Uh, what I try to do in my work, and I think that memory is a great tool for that, is try to show that inevitably, inevitably there are many interpretations in history. And in a way that goes back to the objectivity question as well. There are many ways of looking at the, at, at the past, even the, the very remote past, let alone the very recent past. So I think memory gives us tools, gives us ways, windows into looking at these different interpretations. Uh, one essay I remember that 
really influenced me very much and in a way shaped the way I'm, I'm thinking about history and precisely these very important questions that you're posing was by Peter Burke, this very famous essay in 1993 on narrative and history. And many people were shocked at the time because, uh, I mean, he was a great historian. Uh, he was trying to look at structure versus agency, how much we have moved on since the Annal School, Brudel, and so on and so forth. But at some point in that essay, he talked about how much historians can learn from literature and from cinema. So in literature, he talked about Tolstoy, you know, Proust. Uh, in cinema, he talked about mm, Gillo Pontecorvo. Um, th these people who mm, typically, well, Kurosawa above all, Kurosawa and um, Rashomon, which is this, mm, I mean, in literature, we have that as well with Darrell and the uh, Alexander Quartet. This idea of approaching an event, a story, through different narrators. You have four people saying, talking about the exact same events from different angles. It's the same, of course, in, in uh, Rushmore by, mm -hmm. by Kurosawa. And he was saying, that's what we should do. The, the multiplicity of, of viewpoints. And I think this is what um, I'm trying to do in, in my work, to show that there is not a singular mm, viewpoint. There are many different perspectives. And recently, I think mm, the generational angle that I'm engaging with is also a, it, it privileges precisely this, uh, how different generations lived through the exact same event you get completely different stories. Yeah, I think that this, this came up in, uh, uh, just for the uh, audience's uh, uh, orientation to, to a talk you uh, had in, uh, in Vancouver uh, just the other, the other day, this uh, uh, striking generational divide uh, and tension from generation to generation in the interpretation of very much the, the same kind of uh, uh, event. And thinking of, uh, uh, of, of interviews, but also of, um, to put it crudely, of uh, let's say the data points that go into uh, the kind of uh, uh, work that uh, that you do. So you, you have interviews, and um, um, there is an archive at the same time, or archives, or different forms of archives. Um, what do you see as tensions between the interview material and the archival material? Um, between uh, the very personal kind of story and uh, the archive's tendency to depersonalize. I don't want to ignore Natalie Simon Davis's kind of uh, fiction in the archive notion, but, uh, but do you see a tension and how does one productively engage with that tension, if there is one? First of all, I, I, mm, I'm an oral historian, as I said, mm -hmm. but I belong to uh, a kind of school, maybe old fashioned by now, in, in oral history, uh, which believes that before the interviews, one has to go to the archives. One, the interviews need to be the, the, the last stage, I mean, the most important, of course, but the last stage in, in research. You cannot improvise in an interview. You, know, you need to have fleshed out, first of all, you know, the archives or the, the newspapers or the publications, anything about the, uh, the writings, the, the period that you're interested in so that you can also be in a position of challenging your interviewees. Uh, otherwise, I mean, of course, there is so much um, self-serving, you know, parts in an interviews, uh, you know, people tend to talk about their lives very, very often trying to give coherence to their life itineraries and so on and so, and so forth. And one of the challenges in an oral historian is to precisely challenge this coherence. The best thing to do that, of course, is to try to, and to have a very solid grasp of the period that you're, uh, that you're talking about. But you're absolutely right that there is a tension, there is, there is an epistemological, maybe an ontological tension there between the written uh, 
record and, and all this awe that we have about the written record uh, with, with all these implications of supposed objectivity and so on and so forth, even though, as you implied, we know about the, the subjective choices in uh, creating, uh, creating records, creating archival records, uh, and so on and so forth. But I think uh, the major ten tension is uh, mm, precisely this idea of the, um, what we call today the kind of big data and the, and the, the interviews which is, I mean, how many interviews, I'm talking about qualitative, semi-structured interviews, which are the interviews that I'm doing, I'm not using questionnaires. Uh, how many of them can you, uh, can yeah. you make individually? Um, mm, I don't know, 50, 100, maybe a little bit more. Uh, if you take more than, than that, that would necessarily compromise your, um, uh, your material, but I think the the, the major issue there uh, has to do with representativity somehow. You know, going to the archive, the the illusion that it gives to you is that there you have like a window into society, a society, an institution, you name it. But it's it's big. It's a big picture. Whereas in with the interview again, we're back to the micro to the personal, to the subjective. But the interesting thing, I think, is precisely this issue of, probably this is a fallacy of the social sciences, the issue of representativity. Mm -hmm. How representative is your interviewee? How representative is your sample? Yeah. And this is something, I mean, I'm, I'm working with social movements of the past. It always comes up because sociologists uh, they, you know, it's their field somehow, right? Social movements, and they always ask about representativity. Uh, and this is something that interests me. It bothers me. It's not something that I I reject. I want to have a minimum of representativity. Let's say in terms of urban versus rural, gender, sexuality. Uh, leaders versus grassroots members in a movement, uh, age, again, generations. But I'm so well aware of the incredible limitations of, of this idea of representative. There is never a fully representative sample. So again, I'm going back to literature. Again, I'm going back to Tolstoy and War and Peace, where, you know, you have like, how many characters? I don't know, like f five, six, and through them you get an incredible grasp of the, so the, the social complexities of the time. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, you kind of uh, an anticipated uh, uh, a, a question I was having about uh, the selection of the subjects. Of, uh, uh, how, how do we approach that? Uh, um, uh, to, to go back to, to the Byzantine case, uh, uh, first woman historian, Anna Komnini, uh, in the in the 12th century, is very explicit. Look, I've I've been at the palace. I've met all these guys. I've interviewed them about these battles. I have my representative sample. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, and that is a very different enterprise from a social movement, where as you as you say, you need to uh, to navigate uh, big numbers and really deal with questions of, okay, does this make sense for the experience of the average uh, person? Uh, and, and I'll ask a technical question because I simply don't know. Uh, how do you find uh, the person who is not the artist who was there and we know them, or who was not a leader of the uh, lefty organization, so you could trace that person. How do you uh, uh, find uh, the average Joe or Jane uh, of, of a social movement uh, to, in, to interview? It's, it's a difficult question. Uh, it, it leads us back to this idea of uh, ordinary people. Who are these ordinary people, right? Like history from below. And, and I have to confess that I had that exact issue, uh, especially in my current uh, research uh, leading to this. Uh, to these monographs and the, the generations of transition, because initially I really wanted to, you know, that was that was my my idea. I need to talk to 
uh, average people, you know, people who were not involved in the transitions in any kind of capacity. And then I realized that methodologically that was impo it was an impossible task because theoretically everyone could be, and you know, anyone who could, who, you know, who was there could be, could provide a testimony from the bar owner of the, you know, my neighborhood to you name it. So my, my problem there that I, w was that I had to take, uh, and, I, and I think that in general you have to make methodological choices. Uh, otherwise uh, you're, you're lost in a sea of people and uh, this is kind of impossible. So it, it brings me back to the, the microhistory idea of uh, uh, you know finding a some case studies that again maybe they're not fully representative of uh, something but you know, they're individuals who experienced, who suffered, who reflect about their, um, their past and so on. But I don't have a blueprint of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how to get to them. Uh, most of the time it's, it's, there's a lot of contingency. You have to get lost a little bit in, in the research, talk to many people uh, and little by little, <coughs> you know, find your, find your sample. Uh, I I, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the navigation between generations that came up in this uh, conversation. Uh, and at the same time, your, um, your coming uh, project uh, uh, is, uh, is a comparative uh, project uh, where Greece becomes part of a, of a wider picture. Uh, I mean, Spain and Portugal uh, are, uh, are involved in that. So. Uh, Aside of the dubious honor uh, of their participation in the famous or infamous pigs, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain during the economic crisis, and their uh, democratic transitions in general, are there uh, other elements that make these countries uh, good candidates for comparative work? I think there are. There, are. Um, there, is this, th th there was this term of Southern Europe as you said, unfortunately, it became uh, a very trendy again in inverted commas because of the uh, of the of the recent uh, economic crisis. Well, one of the many crises. <laughs> Apparently, yes, this is yeah. a perma crisis that is not uh, is not ending. But they were the, the epicenter of the uh, of the economic crisis of the, the euro crisis after two thousand nine ten. But the there used to be a um, a period in which these these countries were sort of grouped together as countries which had similar characteristics, and it was it wasn't just the transitions because you're absolutely right that was there was an entire generation of people who we call now pejoratively I think slightly pe pejoratively transitologists, mm -hmm. uh, political scientists basically talking about transitions. Uh, and they, they saw, I mean, Samuel Huntington, of course, with, with the, um, uh, the third wave of, uh, of democratization, uh, is they saw this as, okay, they belong together, this, these three countries. But even before that, there were people like anthropologists, again, much of this is a little bit passé, but who were grouping them together as, uh, you know, countries exporting labor um, to West Germany or France or Belgium at exactly the same time, 1950s, 1960s. Uh, you have all these communities of expats uh, which were created around that time, again feeling that there is something that united them apart from the dictatorships, which was another typical common denominator. Um, this again, anthropological idea, very per se, of the backwardness. Italy was, Southern Italy was often grouped together with them. Um, I remind you of Banfield and this idea of immoral familism in the European South. Again, it was incredible that that idea of the immoral familism, the families as um, multipliers of uh, patronage, clientelism, corruption, yep. uh, feeding in from family to politics. 
uh, it, w it became a, a privileged lens through which to look at this society during the, during the crisis. Um, so all these mm, interpretations were problematic, but they, you know, all of them had some grains of truth in them in terms of another anthropological uh, school was the one uh, which was looking at uh, the, the Mediterranean. Portugal is not part of it, but mm, very often we kind of group it together. Uh, the, the, the famous mm, honor and shame idea, yeah. right? The, the vendettas, the, the Dory system, the, all these things that you have in common, these late modernities, these late industrializations, uh, and so on and so forth, right? I'm not talking about failed modernities there, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I don't share the, the narrative about South and exceptionalism as, you know, the failed modernity, not at all. It's late, it's difficult, but it's a common, there are common patterns there. Uh, so there, there, is, there is a lot more that these countries share beyond the, the transitions to democracy. Just a final thing, Anna, Irene, uh, I, I think um, you, c you can continue. Uh, I wonder what is the lack of an imperial past in the Greek mm -hmm. case uh, do for these kinds of analysis? Does it come up as an issue? Um, does a transitional narrative get to involve questions of engagement with an imperial past? Mm -hmm. um, does it come up? This is a, it's a fascinating question. It is, it is one of the major differences, and there are so many differences between these countries. I mean, we can talk, you know that nowadays, um, I think historians, we feel a little bit, um, I don't know how to call it, emancipated maybe from the, or freed um, from the earlier, more German idea about comparative history. Now, earlier, in earlier years, the idea of comparative history was like, well, you cannot compare apples with oranges. You, you, you have to have a set of comparison and they have to share. I think nowadays, and thanks to political science, uh, you have these books comparing, I don't know, civil wars uh, in Indonesia to civil wars in, you know, Greece. Um, they made us feel like, okay, you know, we can do comparisons with, of very, very different contexts. And that kind of fed into what we call nowadays transnational history, which is, or global history, which is much more, you know, which w w we're much more open to comparing different things. But there are so many differences between Greece, Spain and Portugal. Um, the nationality issue in, in Spain, for example, it's, it's enormous. <laughs> Um, the weight of the Catholic Church, if you, if you like, right, compared to, you know, what's going on in Greece. Um, of course, there is the weight of the Orthodox Church, but can you really compare the two, um, how uh, the impacts, right, they, they have on, 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 on the societies and, and so on. And the imperial past, of course, is, is, a, is a big one. It doesn't come up so much in the Spanish case. I mean, also because Spain, by 1898, I mean, 1898, it, it loses the Cuba and the, and the Philippines, right? I mean, it's the, it's the last colonies. Then there is, you know, a little bit of Sahara and uh, parts of Morocco. But it's not really um, registered in the 20th century as, as an imperial power anymore. It's, it's in, total, in total decadence, even though the Spanish Civil War starts from Morocco and yeah. Franco is, yeah. of course, stationed in Morocco and all this. Uh, but it's not there any longer. This is gone. Whereas Portugal is an imperial power until the 1970s, the mid-1970s. It's the last g big imperial power. And, you know, again, we have it in mind registered as this uh, small, backward, Southern European country with colonies. <laughs> so this is the case in which uh, colonies come up, and they, and they come up also in interviews. I also interviewed people who um, come from, they are like second generation, from people who fled the colonies the, uh, after the Portuguese revolution. 
And I mean, the Portuguese revolution happened at, after 14 years of very bloody colonial wars in Guinea Bissau and Angola in Mozambique. And there are all these white Portuguese, pied noir, let's, let's call <laughs> them, right. who fled, they call it ret returnees in, um, in, in Portuguese, retornados. And there are these, we're talking about uh, half a million people okay. who, I mean, they couldn't stay anymore in, uh, in those spaces and that becoming little by little independent countries. And they went back to, and there is an entire issue there and a taboo of um, silences about them uh, in, in Portugal and silences about the, the colonies and the war crimes and, and all that. So you're absolutely right. I mean, this is an imperial past, which is very painful in Portugal, and it kind of separates it from the other two cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I ask about similarities, uh, similarities of how the dictatorships come about in Spain, Greece and Portugal and what can we say about the democracies afterwards, the, the process of reinstatement of democracy in these, these three countries? Yeah, I mean um, that, that brings us to that idea of uh, again in transitions uh, or transitology. A, a major issue has to do with periodization. How do you periodize? You know what what happens uh, when do when do transitions start when do they when do they finish and the, an interesting thing I mean as we said before about these three countries is that somehow they synchronize in their transitions but the the beginnings the outsets are very very different so we're Portugal we have a regime that starts in 1926 I mean we're talking about an authoritarian dinosaur there, belonging to a very different era, to the, the, the era of fascism, right, interwar. Then you have, of course, Spain uh, with Franco taking over after a very bloody civil war in the late 1930s. And 40 years of, a, again, a bloody dictatorship, very repressive dictatorship uh, that went through various stages, uh, which I find very interesting because then Greece, uh, is a case of, it's a, it's a country that had its own very bloody civil war in the 1940s. Well, you might say that there is a civil war situation going on already in the interwar period, of course, you know, with uh, the monarchists versus the Venezuelists and, and uh, like, let's call them the, the, the anti-monarchists or the republicans mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but you have like outright civil war, of course, in the, 19, in the 1940s. And interestingly, at the end of the civil war, instead of having a Spanish case, you have like this revival of democracy. Of course, it's a very problematic democracy, the democracy of the 1950s, uh, repressive democracy, um, the late Elias Nikolakopoulos, the political scientist, coined the term, or was it sickly, sickly democracy, mm -hmm. because of course it has all kinds of limitations and so on. The Communist Party was outlawed, mm, political refugees, there were people interned in camps uh, for their beliefs, but there was a parliament, um, there was a left-wing party participating in elections, campaigning and so on, despite the violence, despite everything, right? So it's interesting that in, in Greece, instead of joining the other two, it didn't. I mean, for various reasons, of course, Cold War, the, the American uh, involvement, involvement yeah. right, in, in all this, and, uh, and, and Greece became a, a kind of protege after 1949, so could it have been like an outright dictatorship? Well, it becomes an outright dictatorship in 1967 for its own re reasons. And that, again, is very interesting because it, in terms of periodization, it's more, it synchronizes more with Latin America than with other European countries. You don't have coup d'etats in Europe in, in the 1960s, really, right? I mean, you have the last ones in the, in the late 1940s in what was called Eastern Europe, and, and that's it. So it, it synchronizes with Brazil, Argentina, Chile, yeah. you know. Uh, but an interesting thing that again brings them together right before the transitions, and to me, 
it kind of makes them comparable, even with this kind of older idea about who can you compare. Uh, is what we call uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratic authoritarianism. So it's a, it's a sort of, they're not fascist anymore, if they ever were, right? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Portugal and, and, and Spain. They, be, they try to become a little bit more technocratic in the 1960s to survive. Uh, and they try to modernize to survive. And they open up with enormous limitations because there is, again, torture, you know, political police, uh, communist parties outlawed. But they open up to tourism and to some kind of mm, political liberalization, right? Um, softening censorship, uh, typical thing. And that's exactly the point in which they synchronize with the kernels yeah. and with their own liberalization experiment, which failed miserably because of the Polytechnic Uprising of 1973, of course. So it's an, it's an interesting moment there that kind of puts them on the, on the same footing all of a sudden. And then their transitions, mid-1970s, again, they're on the same footing. And these are three transitions that happen for different reasons, very different. You have a uh, mm, revolution, first of all, in, uh, in Portugal. Then you have a, uh, a regime collapse in Greece. And then you have a pacted transition in Spain. So very, very different, but somehow they, you know, they went, they went together. And there is this idea that uh, the path dependency, the famous kind of political science idea, Robert Fishman and others, who say it's precisely the way in which these transitions happened that kind of conditioned the democracies and the quality of, of democracy uh, until the present day. Wonderful. What do you think consider to be the most important legacies from uh, the dictatorships and this process of reinstatement democracy for a 21st century perspective? Yeah, the, le the legacy issue is, a, is, a, is, an, is an interesting and a difficult one because um, it's very difficult to, to say with um, certainty, you know, what the, what the legacies are. Very, very often, for example, during the crisis years, uh, the w there were references in Greece to, uh, from, you know, from the left or from mm, social movements connected to the left grassroots to survivals of authoritarianism, right? In the police, for example, the, that famous slogan of uh, the junta did not end in, in 1973, it kind of implying mm, these kind of authoritarian legacies in Spain. You have the same thing. In the 1980s, um, there was a great scandal about these um, state-sponsored squads which were fighting ETA, the separatist, you know, the Basque separatist organization, and they were kind of extrajudicially executing um, alleged uh, ETA members. It became a, a, major, a major issue that tainted the second uh, Felipe González, the socialist government, in office. If you look at how commentators were talking about this at the time, but even until today, they were saying this is a legacy of you know, late authoritarianism and a failed transition. This is exactly you know, what went wrong with our transition, a transition that did not democratize the state structures, the police, the army, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, the other thing, of course, has to do with when we talk about legacies, and then we talked mm, very much about this uh, before, has to do with uh, transitional justice. Yes. And, and there is a lot of feeling that, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of, again, mm, the quality of democracy, if you like, in the three cases, has to do with did they go through a transitional justice experience or not. Right now, I mean, I live in Spain, so I, I, uh, I can say with, with certainty that in the political dialogue, uh, the present day politics in Spain, this is a major issue. And th there are elections around the corner uh, in 
October going to take place, parliamentary elections in, in Spain. It's a major issue. Um, Valle de los Caídos, the, 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 the Valley of the Fallen, that um, famous space outside Madrid, which was this mausoleum that Franco built in the 1950s and where uh, he was buried as well, and which became like a shrine for nostalgics of, uh, of the regime. There was all this idea of there was never a transitional justice. So it was never a thing of what do we do with this mausoleum? It's still there. It's the most fascistic space that exists in Europe right now, I think. Um, and, and, and it's part of the, of the political campaigning. What do we do with this? The government decided to remove Franco's remains from there and his family agreed to you know, bring them to a family grave. But it's, it's a political, it's, it's a subject about politics now. So there you can, you can see how pertinent what happened or what did not happen in the 1970s is, I think to some extent, we're still a little bit haunted. But I know that it's a, it's, it's a very kind of heavy term, uh, but I, I believe that there, there is some truth to it. To, to it. Um, we're still haunted by choices that were made in the 1970s. Um, which has to do with, with, with these kind of things, you know, in Europe, again, what kind of re relation do we have uh, with, uh, with Europe? What kind of relation do we have with immigrants? Uh, I think it, it really goes back to debates, you know, nationalism, of course, national identities. Uh, that major slogan of Andreas Papandreou, for example, in Greece, Greece belongs to the Greeks, is it, a, a very 70s thing that had a powerful revival now as a, a, as a rightist slogan. But it's like we're a bit stuck in some major issues, major choices or lack of choices that go back to the 70s. Yeah. Uh, could we also talk about the resistance uh, in your work specifically the monograph Children of the Dictatorship. You talk a lot about student uh, youth movements. Can we talk about their contribution as we, have, as we go to the reinstatement, gradual to reinstatement for the back to the democracy? Yes, um, in that uh, book, uh, there is a, there's a little excerpt that I would like to, uh, to uh, read out loud. It's from uh, Melina Mercuri, the actress and political activist and Minister of Culture, uh, and she says, quote, this is from the late 60s, I learn now of the shooting of Duchke in Berlin of, and of Martin Luther King in America. I knew Martin Luther King and I passed precious hours with him. I knew this boy who is lying gravely wounded in Berlin. I know what is happening in the world. The world is burning. I now have a feeling of what is happening in the world. I feel more for the Vietnamese um, or for the black people in America. I'm less egocentric about Greece because everything is like that. She joins her little fingers. Everything links. I think this idea of that everything links is a, a major idea in the book and also um, has to do with your, with your question. I think we're, we're talking about students in the late 1960s and 1970s who were conceptualizing, understanding themselves as parts of a wider movement. Um, it, it was not just about Greece, it was not just about Spain, it was not just about Portugal. Um, this was a movement, this was a generation that shared many things and it could be things and, and that they shared with, with people also outside, outside Southern Europe or Europe for that matter. So there is this very interesting kind of global thinking or glocal rather, like uh, thinking globally and acting locally as we say today uh, uh, in them. And I think in, in intellectual terms but also in terms of as a social movement or as social movements, they imported mm, very interesting strategies of uh, how, to, how to fight an authoritarian regime from elsewhere, uh, they, they were very eclectic in their the strategic toolkit uh, 
that they used uh, against um, against the colonels in particular in Greece, but we can expand it also to uh, to Spain and uh, and Portugal. So um, just to to say a final word on this, um, Greece separates itself somehow from the other two cases from Spain and Portugal because even though mm, there are very strong student movements in uh, Spain and Portugal as well for different reasons it's all in Greece that a major event such as the Polytechnic uprising and the crashing of the Polytechnic uprising the occupation of the Athens Polytechnic for three days in, in November of 1973 uh, took place. You don't have a similar mm, mass movement in the other in the other two um, two cases with such a bloody ending, uh, a major trauma. Uh, again, in, in a major point of reference during the the transition. It's not it's not a coincidence that somehow we keep going back to that generation, to that event, and so on and so forth. You don't, you don't have that in the other, in the other mm. two cases. And, and still focusing on, on Greece, uh, could you talk about the cultural production uh, during the dictatorship years? What transpires, film or literature, or both, or m perhaps more on film? There is a, a very interesting, a very vibrant, dynamic cultural production, especially, I would say, um, after the first years of the dictatorship. The first years of the dictatorship are characterized by, by a general stagnation, I would say, uh, in, in terms of culture. Um, I mean, because of the, the shock, but the, 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 the harsh censorship as well. Uh, also, um, writers, artists, they decided to go silent. It, 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 this was this typical strategy of, uh, we don't want to submit our work to the censorship, right? Um, that changes. It changes after 69 and so on. And th in the 70s, there is already a new, let's call it, generation or wave of artists who believe that that strategy of silence was not a good one. Um, you need to somehow take advantage of the cracks in the system uh, to get a message across. So mm, to play along with the with the censorship, basically. And it's it's, it's very interesting what censorship can do. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that it's great, <laughs> but people can be very inventive in uh, you know how to bypass censorship. Uh, there is an entire generation of artists who became very, very skillful in using techniques that had to do with allusions, metaphors, innuendos. And interestingly, there is an entire audience that also trained in se itself in reading through the lines. Because th that wouldn't make sense, it wouldn't have an impact if people could not read through the lines, for example, in Angelopoulos, when he does Days of 36 in 1973, which is a film on a dictatorship, the Metaxas dictatorship of the 1930s, but it's so obvious that you're talking about another dictatorship so that you castigate the current dictatorship, right? And this, this was obvious to people. And you have mm, many, uh, many artists who use the, uh, the exact same, uh, same thing. The other thing which uh, I would like to stress is this, going back to tra tradition, and tradition is a, again, powerful toolkit to fight against the regime's own appropriation of tradition. The, the, the regime of the colonels was very chauvinistic, it was all about you know, going back to folk dances uh, and so on. So many musicians in particular, they, they played around with, with this idea of using folk, mm -hmm. but as, as a way of, of uh, struggling against the, the regime's own appropriation of folk. So it was an alternative folk, more, more like Bob, Bob Dylan-y folk, right? Uh, um, and, uh, and a little bit of, uh, it wasn't purist. It was like, we're going to 
undermine the purism of the, the, the regime's folk with a folk that was kind of um, distorted. It was like using folk melodies, but mm, electric guitar as well, and, uh, and distorted voices. So you were undermining tradition, it was clear. Like, you know, Savopoulos, for example, and Marisa Koch, and people like that. I also wanted to ask you about films that are reflecting, or TV shows, like uh, the best, Our Best Years, Ta Kalitera Mas Chronia, uh, which have explored nostalgia for that time period, um, for the dictatorship, and they are very popular. Could you talk a little bit about that? Why do you think it's such a, it, they have such an appeal to the audience? Yeah, I think that that's a common that's a common trend. It's not just in Greece. Uh, there is there is nostalgia for the '60s and '70s, which I think has to do a lot with the aesthetics. It's a it's a highly aestheticized period. It's all about you know Beatlemania and and bell bottoms and um, Vespas and and things like that. And there is the, you know the and and um, sideburns uh, and, and and there is a, a fascination for this a supposed mm, period of innocence as well. And uh, you can see that this is, this is shared uh, in throughout the, the European South. So the Chrona that you mentioned is, uh, is a concept that, that was initially a Spanish concept, uh, but it proved to be very popular in Portugal, in Chile, in Argentina, but and also in Greece, because it plays around with this, uh, with this nostalgia. It's not the first time, it's a trope, and the trope is, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that people who direct these shows, just like films as well, they were kids during the dictatorship yeah. years. So there is a sort of inevitable nostalgia for their childhood years. Uh, and they, they kind of fail the test of introducing also a more critical distance to, to this. So they. They, they fall into the trap of sanitizing somehow these, um, these years through this focus on the aesthetics and so on. Ha having said that, however, um, it's, it's a show that brings uh, forward this idea of the, the personal. Yeah. Again, maybe going back to our initial discussion of the micro histories within the wider history. Yeah. So it's like people who were, you know, like these um, ordinary people, the average family, their everyday lives, uh, but history is thrust upon them somehow. You know, incredible events happen, violent events, and somehow we can, we can see through the, these shows an interesting approach of um, it, very clumsy at times, but still, it's an it's an interesting experiment of how do ordinary people live in extraordinary times? What do they do? How do they deal with these events? Uh, how do they um, navigate these times? And, and, and one of the conclusions uh, that comes out of the show, which I think is a very accurate one, and it kind of coincides with what historians say about history of everyday life, is that mm, very often people go ahead with their everyday chores and with their everyday obsessions and with, uh, you know, sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a date on the day the coup happened. It's like, oh no, the, 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 there is a martial law that in, and, and people cannot move around, so I'm, I'm going to miss the date. It, it sounds silly, but it's very, very close to what we deduct from history of everyday life, oral history, uh, memory, and so on. And that's, again, to go back to, to, to our initial discussion, a very interesting experiment to do in oral history, to use mm, insights f of such shows and so on to challenge people's narratives. Because again, people want to show that they had heroic lives, that all they cared about was politics. And then you, you got to, cha to challenge that as an interviewer. And very often that can be s very, very fruitful. Do we have a question, time for one more question? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a, uh, a reflection first on something you said earlier on and then just a, a, a final uh, a question, I, 
I, I find very interesting what you uh, said about uh, censorship. Uh, there's this uh, Russian uh, uh, writer, Lev Losev, who has this book on the beneficence of censorship, who, whose, whose whole argument is that you know, the Soviet Union made Russians better readers. Mm -hmm. um, subtle readers and, of course, subtle writers for audiences that uh, are very attuned to, uh, to, to, to messages that might be floating about. And then the censor becomes almost a productive kind of uh, uh, mechanism, which might play into the nostalgia, a nostalgia for a time when we had a cat and mouse game and we were creative. Um, but that's just a commentary that does not contribute too much. Let me. Uh, ask a, f a, a wrapping up question if you want. Um, we're here um, having a, uh, a conversation, an interview format, uh, which we hope to have open to uh, a wider uh, uh, audience. Uh, can we reflect then on the place of public scholarship in um, the modern university and the, the world around it? Um, what has been your experience uh, uh, in the various countries and institutions you have uh, worked in? In terms of uh, uh, administrative kind of valuing of that kind of scholarship, and also a, a, a perhaps a peculiar question: having written a book uh, on contemporary issues, which in Greece uh, are are really still debated, discussed, intergenerationally argued, um, have you had any sense of how? your own work becomes part of a dialogue, if you think that it has, I don't know. You mean a wider dialogue? Yeah. Uh, beyond yeah. academia? Oh, yes. So, I mean, first of all, let, let me just say that I, I really uh, share what you said about uh, the Russian uh, writer, and uh, I'm all for this kind of opening up to a more global understanding of um, repression, censorship. I, I think it's, it's very fruitful ground for comparative research. You know, to, to look at Samistad, for example, and what was going on in Eastern Europe or even the Soviet Union, and again, how people train themselves, as you were saying. And there is a Foucault as well was, was, was saying, I think that censorship can be enabling mm -hmm. uh, in a very perverse way, of course, precisely because it pushes people to, to be more creative and uh, and so on and so forth. And, and to just just a tiny thing, I got to Losev trying to understand Byzantine texts <laughs> and the existence of, of authors within regimes that could be dangerous as well. Yeah, so, yeah. But back to you. Yeah. yeah and the, the interesting thing with censorship is also what what happens when censorship disappears. And there is a there is a lot of talk about transitions. Did it disappear immediately? Probably didn't. Again, survivals, remnants. Uh, and so on and so forth, but people, artists, did not have the same barriers anymore, and that was an issue, you know. They would use the same code, some of them, as if they were still operating under mm -hmm. an authoritarian regime, or if they didn't, they weren't as creative anymore, and uh, they went through an existential crisis. Anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, issue. But uh, to, to go back to your, to your final question, it, it, it's a major, it's a major issue of, uh, of today, of the present. I mean, this is one of the good things of, you know, operating in, in a democratic system and um, with new technologies. Uh, I think that we value more and more this idea of uh, uh, bringing knowledge out of academia, out of the ivory tower, uh, making it more accessible, make it part of a, of a wider, di wider dialogue, as, you're, uh, as you say. And uh, I personally, uh, I always try to, to have a, mm, an, a wider impact uh, beyond the academic community, not just through articles in, uh, in newspapers, but also uh, I was always involved in audiovisual ideas like mm, documentaries in, uh, in particular, which again can be uh, more and more easily made nowadays. So I think that academics can also be more flexible in the way in which they get involved in this kind of um, uh, production, of, uh, production of knowledge. But 
you, you mentioned, uh, I think, the, the idea of, of public, the, the public history and the public historian, and I think it's a very, very fruitful concept. Um, I'm in Spain, I have, I'm lucky enough to be part of, a, of a, a department, the Department of Contemporary History at the Autonomous University of Madrid, which is a department that very consciously um, supports the idea of public history. Uh, there, there is a major historian, Jesus Izquierdo, who is a major public historian there, and uh, we created a master course uh, in, in public history right now. And the idea of the master course was also to try to see how students who are going to take it are going to be linked to various outlets beyond academia, uh, media, museums, uh, even Mm, people who are involved in uh, um, computer games uh, that use history, uh, you name it. Uh, there, is a, there is an entire mm, avalanche of, of possibilities that can, that can bring you outside uh, academia. And I think we need to think outside the box. So uh, if I've seen my own, my own work going mm, beyond academia, I think because it, is, it tends to be political and it tends to, uh, to talk about generations, social movements, student movements, uh, the, mm, it is somehow some, something that, I, I don't want to say easily, but it tends to kind of permeate also spaces uh, beyond beyond academia, for better or or worse, I think it's I think it's for the better. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, for this opportunity to have uh, a conversation, for uh, taking a whole trip to have this conversation and many others uh, that uh, uh, we've had and you will be having on uh, on uh, on the west coast uh, of the North American continent. Uh, it is perhaps a, a good opportunity uh, for us to point out that Costis uh, uh, is uh, here uh, with us as part of uh, uh, a three-year pilot program that has been funded by the Stavros Niachos Foundation that was envisaged uh, as an opportunity to bring uh, uh, Greek academics and academics working on Greece uh, uh, from more distant parts of the world uh, towards us. Uh, and create a circulation of ideas. Uh, in the context of this uh, uh, project, we anticipate the opportunity of uh, having also artists and writers who will also join us uh, and then make the trip uh, down to UCLA, our partner in this uh, grant, for exactly these kinds of conversations. And because you closed with uh, the issue of uh, uh, training, uh, uh, informing uh, young historians uh, in, uh, in, in ways that do not necessarily lock them into an academic world that is, let's face it, challenging. Uh, I also want to point out that part of the very same pilot program that uh, we, in many ways we're initiating uh, uh, here with this, uh, with this interview is to also provide uh, uh, digital skills uh, to, uh, to students uh, and to create uh, ways of thinking about careers uh, out of the uh, often very narrowly conceived ac academic world of history into a world that, that if I should say, needs historians. <laughs> um, again, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us. Uh, and thank you for all of you who uh, will have watched this uh, video for uh, remaining engaged with uh, the activities of our center. Thank you so much for having me. It was a fantastic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.